Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so we are in a series right now on the story of Joseph, the life of Joseph. And if you were with us last week, we looked at Joseph and his multicolored coat, specifically his sleeves that went all the way to the wrist. And if you didn't learn about the sleeves going to the wrist, you need to go back and watch last week's. But we learned all about that and how he got thrown into a pit because he did all these things wrong with his brothers, like he was flaunting his coat, and he told them all about his dreams where they were going to bow down to him, and all these things went wrong. They got really mad. His 11 brothers got really mad, and they threw him in a pit. Do you remember? It was a bad day for Joseph, and he got sold into slavery in Egypt. And that's the way Genesis chapter 37, and we're going through these 13 chapters together over the next five weeks or so. But that's the way last week's ended, chapter 37. And Pastor Ricky and I were talking about how to lay out this series. And what we're going to do is we're going to go from chapter 37 and we're going to leap right to chapter 39. And that's what I was going to preach today. And I was going to skip 38 entirely. Why would a pastor ever skip scripture? Because it's such a messy chapter. This chapter, chapter 38, is probably one of the top three, top four Jerry Springer super messy episodes in all of scripture. Like this is not what you want to teach in Sunday school. Here's what happened. It's about one of Joseph's older brothers, uh, Judah is his name. He was fourth in line. Out of the 12 brothers, he was born fourth. And Judah at this point in the story He's in his probably late 40s, I'm just going to guess. And he's got three grown sons. And here's their names. It's Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right. I'm just taking a stab at it. But Ur, E-R, is the firstborn son. Ur marries a woman named Tamar. And Tamar, it, it, it goes bad. And Ur, the scripture says, was a wicked man. And God killed him. You're like, well, explain that, Pastor. No, I'm going to move on as fast as possible. I don't know why God killed him on the spot, but he did. And all of a sudden, Tamar's a widow. And so here's what the culture was. The culture, this, patri- the, this patriarchal culture at the time said that if a woman had, and, and her husband has died, she, she becomes a widow. If she has no child, she has no rights in that culture And she is financially vulnerable, not stable. It's a very bad position to be in. It was so bad that the law also required at that time that the second brother in line had to marry her and give her a child. And that's the way it was supposed to work in order to protect this widow. And so Judah follows the law. He grabs the next brother in line, Onan, and has him marry Tamar. Onan was also wicked in the sight of the Lord, and God struck him dead. Again, I'm not going to explain that one either. But again, no child. So Judah is sitting here with his three sons. And two of them are dead already. And he's looking over at Tamar and looking at his third son. And he's seeing a pattern, right? <laughs> She's some kind of spiritual black widow. I don't know if I would. So he doesn't. He doesn't marry the third son to her. And and, and sadly, Tamar's father-in-law in that moment culturally abandons her to a really bad place. And this is where things get really weird and dysfunctional. Because Tamar, that's not the end of, of this particular story. Tamar takes things into her own hands. She puts on a disguise. She dresses up like a prostitute and she goes down to the red light district. And if your kids are in the room, I'm sorry. (laughs) But she waits there, and she waits there for Judah, her father-in-law. And we don't know why she waited there for him. There must have been a life pattern for Judah of going there. So she waits for him, and he comes along, and he doesn't recognize her disguise, and he takes her, and he has sex with her, and she becomes pregnant, and he leaves the entire episode and has no idea that this was Tamar, his daughter-in-law, all along. And then the story goes forward that all of a sudden, the, the, she, because she became pregnant, the, the extended family starts to realize that she's pregnant now, and word starts to pass through the family, T- Tamar must be sleeping around because she's pregnant. And it gets back to father-in-law Judah, and Judah becomes enraged and says, then we've got to kill her. 
because she hasn't been moral. She hasn't been pure. And he even says, let's burn her. Wow, such a soft-hearted guy. And of course, Tamar, she can prove that Judah is the dad. And this is before DNA technology, right? There's a whole story in there. You can read about it yourself in chapter 38. But she's able to prove that Judah is the father, and she confronts Judah in front of the rest of the family. And he has to back off and say, okay, I guess we're not going to kill you. Because guess what? Not only did you do wrong, but who else did wrong? And so what we're going to do is we're just going to sweep this under the rug. And that's the way that chapter ends. And she has the child, and it's actually twins. And I want you to imagine what it's like to be part of the barbecues at Grandpa Judah's house. <laughs> and the twins running around. And do they call him Grandpa or Dad, or what do we even do? And are they cousins? Are they nephews? What, what's going on? And it's kind of a messy family situation. Some of you are like, sounds like the family I grew up in kind of situation. Let me just tell you this. One of the twins' names was Perez. And when you go to Matthew chapter 1, and it gives you the genealogy of Jesus Christ, as you go down through the names, and it's about five down from the top, it says that his, the, the Messiah himself came through the line of Perez from the tribe of Judah whose mother was Tamar. And Matthew inserts it in there, whose mother was Tamar. Just wants to remind you, Jesus came from a very messed up situation. If you're here today and you're like, you know what, that sounds a little bit like my family, you're in good company. The Savior himself. And Jesus turned out okay, amen? Amen, amen. So that's chapter 38. Do you see why I wanted to skip it? So now I'm gonna skip it. We're gonna go to 39. Just describe that to you. We're actually going to come back to that later. So you can look forward to that. Joseph, back to Joseph. Joseph, at the beginning of chapter 39, he's 17 years old. And he gets sold into slavery in Egypt. So let's look at verse 1. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian op officer. And Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And so Joseph goes to the slave auction, essentially. Potiphar, who is head of the king's intelligence service, bodyguard, he's a big, big deal. Potiphar's a big deal. Potiphar goes and chooses Joseph and buys him to run his household. Again, Joseph is 17 years old, very, very young guy. He just got two new cousins he doesn't know about. Verse 2 happens. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this. Notice Potiphar notices his business success, his management success, and Potiphar is going to give credit to God. Realize that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant and put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. Now, you've got to see the progression because this is a season of business promotion for Joseph, and you need to see it that way because our culture gets kind of screwed up about this. Sometimes the message that's sent to our teens and our 20-somethings is that if you're really good at your job, you'll shoot right to the top, you'll be CEO in a month. Am I wrong? This is a season of promotion for Joseph. We're going to get every indication throughout all of Joseph's story that he's an amazingly gifted administrator and leader. And so this is his very first real shot in showing what he's capable of, and he starts rising through the ranks. But it takes time. You wonder why it takes time. Maybe God's growing the character to match his gifts. Maybe. So, the, you know, it starts like you would imagine it's going to start. Maybe Potiphar brings him in and says, okay, you're going to be in charge of the kitchens and all the food and all the cooks. You're going to be in charge of that. And then he set, steps back and he waits and he watches to see how will this go. And then it goes really, really well. All the food's perfect and it's hot and it's on time. Amen? You're not thinking about food yet, are you? Not yet. 
And then that goes so well, so he promotes him and he gives him maybe lawn and grounds. And then he promotes him and he gives him all the finances and you're going to run all that as well and all the household cleaning. And he just keeps growing and growing and growing. And all of a sudden he's got the whole household. It's a good day for him. We don't respect in the church business owners and managers enough. Let me just say that. Sometimes we over-spiritualize some of the positions in the church, and we forget just how much God is using you in the workplace. Because just like Joseph, God is using you and your skills and your gifts in the workplace, and people are seeing you in your sweet spot, and they're glorifying God in heaven for it. Joseph teaches us that. Verse 5, from the, from the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake, and all his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops, his livestock flourished, so Potiphar had a great day. He gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't have to worry about a thing except what kind of food was in the fridge. I love that. So many good lessons. Now let's turn to verse 7 because this is where the story takes a difficult turn. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. The Hebrew there is a, a very, very short, curt phrase. Basically means sex now. Are you awake, second service? <laughs> sex now. Why would she do that? Because he's a slave and she's in the habit of giving orders. And this is just one more order to give to him. Sex now. But Joseph refused, verse 8. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you were his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. So Joseph breaks down his logic here for a second. He says, I'm not going to sleep with you no matter what you do. And here's why. Number one is it would be a sin against your husband. And there's a little bit of a, a tone here to me that it's like he's got a relationship with Potiphar. Even though he's a slave, even though Potiphar's the boss, friendship and trust has built over time. He might have been in this spot growing through the ranks. This might have been a seven or eight year period. Could have been. We don't know exactly. He comes here at 17. By the time he gets to Pharaoh, and some of you guys know the story, by the time he gets to Pharaoh, he's going to be 30 years old. That means 13 years pass. This might be seven or eight years in. He's got a relationship with, he's like, I'm not going to betray him. So he sees it as a sin against him. But second, he sees it as a sin against God. It's a wicked thing against God, he says. And this is big because this is the very first time that we get evidence. And if you're, if you're a student of the scripture, this is the first spot we get in Joseph's life that he's got his own faith. That he loves God himself. And we don't know exactly how that looked in him. But all of a sudden in this moment, it became important to him. It was guiding his decisions. There was a faith there. Verse 10, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. I just love that he physically avoided her presence as much as he possibly could. Just really quick, have you ever heard the term hostile work environment? <laughs> That's this. Here's a tougher one. Have you ever heard the words power differential? That's gotten a lot of play recently in our culture. That sometimes a sexual encounter isn't as simple as it looks on the surface. But sometimes there's a power differential there. Could I just encourage you to see for just a brief moment that this is in the scripture. And there's a power differential here. See, she has power over him, does she not? Because in that culture, if he doesn't do what she says, she can accuse him of pretty much anything she wants to. And who's going to get believed? She will. She's the one with the power. Do you think Joseph is smart enough to know that? Yes. 
And see, here's what's weird. And some of you guys grew up in Sunday school like I did. And you always heard this story as a, hey, you ought to try to overcome lust in your life because of the sexual temptations that are around us. That's the way we tend to be taught this story. But hold on a second. We get no indication in this passage at all that he's attracted to her. This may not be a lust episode at all. Again, sometimes people just read that right in the text. It's like, well, he's a man and she's a woman. So if, if the temptation is brought to him, he must want to have sex with her. Not necessarily. And I know this is really raw and edgy. Are you doing okay? We all right so far? She might be really unattractive. It says he was handsome. It doesn't say anything about her. Sometimes it's what the Bible doesn't say, you know what I mean? And she had a great personality. Ooh, I should, I didn't say that for a service. I should, I should, I should have said that. <laughs> she was likely much older than him. She might not have been attractive to him. So what's, what's the challenge that 17-year-old Joseph, again, maybe he's in his early 20s at this point. Maybe this has been several years, but still a young man. What's the challenge he's really facing here? Is it lust or is the real challenge he's facing having to do with power, potential consequence, and fear? And you got to bring this up and you got to really face it. And here's why, because some of you have faced that challenge. Some of you have been in those very difficult, sticky circumstances where they're not saying they'll use their power against you, but you can feel it in the atmosphere. And you still have to take it into account. I think Joseph was smart enough to take it into account. And I think it was complex. I think it was messy for him. Very, very tough situation. And just so that we're clear, the Bible isn't trying to say women are the aggressors here. Because you fast forward to 1 Samuel and you get to King David and he's the aggressor with Bathsheba and you find the exact same scenario where you've got somebody with the power and somebody without the power and they are propositioned sexually. And there's a whole lot the Bible doesn't say in that passage either. So the Bible is an equal opportunity player when it comes to sexual harassment. I'm just going to say that. She's going to use her power. Verse 11, one day, however, no one else was around when, she went in, when he went in to do his work. Potiphar's wife came and grabbed him by the cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. This young man's running in his underwear outside the house. He just ran for it. You'll see this pop up, this kind of phrasing is going to pop up in the New Testament. Inspirationally, sometimes we need to flee from sin run from sin. Sometimes you don't sit down and negotiate with a temptation. Amen? Some of us are like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to try and fight this thing. Don't try to fight it. Run for it. Verse 13, when she saw that she, when she, saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants Soon all the men came running. I just think there's a moment here where he's run out of the house in his underwear. She knows she's got to explain this somehow. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And there was not an outside panel objective investigation done of this sexual encounter, of course. She made the accusation. She was believed. And that's the way that this thing went down. Because she had the power. The threat of using her power was always there. And it absolutely comes through in this particular situation. And Potiphar throws Joseph in jail. Tough day. Joseph would have expected that. Actually, scholars think Joseph probably would have expected more. Scholars are actually really surprised that the punishment that comes to the young man here is basically a life prison term. They're surprised at that because in the ancient world, if a slave tried to rape the spouse of the master of the house, death. 
death. So why in the world did Potiphar just give him prison? Scholars guess that maybe he suspected something was fishy. So Joseph did the right thing, and now he's in prison. So go back to the context here. So in the first chapter we talked about last week, he did some bad things, right? Not evil, maybe, dumb things, and got thrown into a pit. It was a bad day. Maybe he, as he's getting sold into slavery, maybe he learned some lessons as a result of that. Doesn't mean he deserved what he got, but maybe he learned some lessons from that. Here, you see a very different Joseph. You see a very wise Joseph. You see a high character Joseph in this particular narrative. But he still gets thrown into prison. Has anybody in this church ever had a day where you feel like you did the right thing, it was really hard, and you still got thrown in jail? And you're looking up to heaven and saying, what the heck, God? I thought I did the right thing. Some of you did all the right things in church and through your teen years and and stayed pure and did all kinds of things. And then, then your marriage still went south. And you're looking up and saying, what the heck, God? You give a whole lot of money to the church and you serve and you're a great leader and all this kind of stuff. And you still get cancer. And you're looking up to heaven and saying, what the heck, God? That's real, isn't it? People who walk away from God entirely at a moment like this, they say, how can bad things happen to good people? And I'm a good person and this stinks. And how could you? Many people, this becomes the moment where they fall away. So the fact that Joseph doesn't, and you're going to see next week that he doesn't, it's a miracle. Shows a lot about him. So, What should the message be about today? How about let's do a sermon on how to be a good leader in business? How about let's do a sermon on how to avoid sexual temptation? Let's do a sermon on why God actually even cares about what we do in the bedroom. That'd be a good one, right? How about we do a sermon on why bad things happen to good people sometimes and what to do about it? All good sermons. I'm not preaching any of them. Here's why. Because I got to the end of it, and I, it, it, it finally occurred to me. I don't think this crazy Jerry Springer, Judah and Tamar story right before this story is a mistake. Moses is the person who wrote the first five books of the Bible later. It's just a little scholarly note for you. When Moses sat down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he wrote down the history of this family, why in the world did he put Judah and Tamar right before the story of Joseph? It breaks it up. If you're editing a good movie for the theaters, you're going to edit that out. Why did he put it in there? And I just kept staring at it and asking myself that question. And I think this is why. I think it's about the soul. So let's look at it this way. Look at Joseph, and let's look at his life on the outside. I'm going to move through this very, very quickly. But on the outside, he's a slave. He has no rights. He's got nothing. He's also now in prison. You're not just a slave. You're a slave in prison. You're at the lowest of the low. Right? No possessions, no comforts. It's a bad life right now for him. He's also poor. He's also on the inside, he's accused for something he didn't do. And he's disrespected. His reputation is trash at this point. On the outside, you do not want to be this guy. But look at his heart on the inside. What about his soul? He's got peace. And that word peace there is going to mess with you right now because you're like, I don't know that the first day in his jail cell, he felt a lot of peace. Probably not. But I think he came to a painful peace. And when I say painful peace, many of you in the room know exactly what I'm talking about. A place where all the stuff on the outside is screaming right now. But I've got this lifeline and an anchor to God because I know I'm where he wants me to be and I'm hanging on. And there's a peace in that. And that's the kind of peace he had. And this inner respect of like, I know my integrity is there. I know that who I say on the I am on the outside is what I did when no one else was looking. 
I know that. And maybe it doesn't mean much to a lot of people. And maybe nobody believes me. But I know, and God knows. And he saw me. And so he's got an inner respect. And he honored his friend. He honored Potiphar. And he knows he did that. And that deepens his life pattern of good and deepens his faith in God. Because that's the way we are as human beings, aren't we? When we make one next right decision, the next right decision after that is a little bit easier. Yes? Like, have you ever been driving and ever been cut off before? You're like, never in Lawton, Oklahoma. That would never happen. <laughs> have you ever been cut off before? And then what do you want to do? You want to gently, Christianly respond to the person, right? With words, with actions, with looks, with spiritually appropriate hand signals to them. <laughs> right? Like, that's, those are the things that you want to do in the moment. But let's just say that, in that on that particular day, God's got a hold of your soul and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. And you fight it and you get past it and you act kindly. You don't even pull up next to them and glare at them because that's usually legal, right? Like we think that. You don't even do that part. You just got past it and you let it go. Every single time you let it go like that, you know how much easier it gets to let it go next time? Because you just made a deposit in your character and in your soul. And that's what Joseph was doing. He was making very hard decisions under threat. And it was changing him, deepening him. Now let's look at Judah. Do you remember Judah and Tamar from the beginning of the story? Do you remember father-in-law Judah with the grandkids slash kids? How's he look on the outside? Well, he's a free man. Everything's great. He's, he's got home. He's got family. He's got everybody running around him. It's barbecues. It's everything. He's wealthy and he's comfortable. He's accomplished. He's got all the stuff. He's doing great. And he's respected by the people who decide to play along with the mask he's wearing, by the way. He's got that version of respect. And we know what that's like. But what's going on inside of his soul? Guilt. Because he knows. By the time we get to the end of this story, He's going to stand in front of Joseph someday and he's going to explain how much this has been tormenting him all along that he sold his own brother into slavery. It's absolutely eaten him up. So what's the quality of his soul right now? It's guilt. It's inner disrespect. He's got, he has secretly hurt his family and he knows it. The deepening life pattern of selfishness that's in him. Every single time you feed the other beast, by the way, that beast in your life gets bigger and is deepening doubt of God. Because what is sin except us trying to solve our problems on our own in our way instead of trusting God to solve it for us? That's, that's sin. So let's summarize these two guys just real quick. We've got Judah on the outside. Looks great. His soul, though, is miserable. Joseph on the outside looks miserable, and his soul is healthy. Do you see why the author of the scripture put these two chapters side by side? Both of them were big sexual encounter temptation challenges. And he's holding two people up side by side for us to say, and saying one of these things is not like the other. And which would you rather have? Proverbs 16.8 says, better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. And we know it. We know it. It's a challenge to us. Could we just all admit that everything in the world is pushing us to improve what's on the outside? To address what's on the outside. To build what's on the outside. Go to social media. Are we talking about your soul there? No. What we're trying to attain at our, at our workplaces, is it often about the soul? No. It's about the next big house. It's about the boat. And it's about the 401K. It's about all of those things. All those things that are on the outside. Do you see what the scripture is trying to hit us with right now? Is how's your soul doing today? How is it? How's your soul? How's your heart? the spirit that's inside of you that's bigger than all of this. 
the spirit inside of you that every time you make a choice, it touches that part of you, even if nobody else sees it. And based on where that is, the stuff that pours out of you that's, that's real and authentic, and that's the part of you that will go into eternity. How's your soul today? I think that's the point here. You are a soul. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath, that's the neshama of life, into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Now let me just tell you that that word neshama there, that actually gets used three times in that verse, or variants of it. The verse basically says that when God formed man, that his physical body out of the dust of the ground, he neshamed into him the divine neshama of God. And man became a living neshama. Not a person, a divine breath. God breathed the divine breath into you, and you are walking around today as a divine breath. You are a divine breath. What am I? You're a soul. You're a soul. You're a heart. You're a spirit. You're a, you're a divine breath. There's something about you that goes beyond what we can see. George MacDonald, Scottish preacher, said this, Never tell a child you have a soul. Teach him you are a soul and you have a body. Because once we start to realize that, and some of you scholars in the room, you're like, I know, but the Bible talks about hearts and it talks about the human spirit and talks about the soul. And like I can do a 10-page dissertation on how these are all a little, little bit separate. Yeah, but they're mostly the same. And the Bible mostly uses them interchangeably in the scripture. So I'm going to use them that way today because it's simpler for us. <clears throat> but you are a divine breath. Revelation 20 verse 4 says our souls are eternal. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. And watch this. They all came to life again and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's their souls coming back to physical life again. That's resurrection into a new body. Why? Because the soul was still there. It means you're immortal, whether you like it or not. You're immortal. You'll never die. Your soul, your divine breath is who you are, and it will go on. Let's be real. The, the world talks about this. The world talks about the fact that all you are is your brain synapses firing, and your brain matter stores your memories, and that is the essence of what you believe you are. So when you die and your body and your brain matter starts to turn to gelatin, into mush, post mush, there will be no more you. That's what the world would tell you. The scripture comes along and says, no, you're much more. Post mush, you live on, whether you like it or not. You are a soul. And then you have to feed your soul. This is Mark 7. This is Jesus talking. He says, don't you understand either? He asked, can't you see that the food that you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes to the sewer. And you see what he's saying there. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. The actions you take, the words you say, the, the, the thoughts you think. For, for from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, and murder. So Jesus is saying, you've got this divine breath here. You've got this soul. And the quality of this thing, it depends on what you do with it. And the more you enter into destructive activity, the more you bring that destruction into your own soul. You tweak your soul like Judah did. And the more you bring goodness into it, the more you follow the way of Jesus, the more it starts to change you. Every act of trust, every act of unselfishness, every act of mercy actually makes you a more merciful, unselfish person. It's the way that God made it. He gives us, um, he gives us an independent soul. Your actions come from your soul. Matthew 12, 35. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. So when I say, how's your soul? See what Jesus is doing here? He's saying, depending on where our soul is, that's what comes out. And you kind of, 
You can't get away from that. Your soul matters today. Joseph's soul mattered. Judah's soul mattered. Your soul matters today. So there's a mentor in my life. His name's Kirk Bodie. Kirk Bodie was like a father to me in the faith. And some of you know what I mean by that. The Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, he said, you don't have many fathers, Timothy. You don't have many fathers. This guy was like a father to me. Great man, very accomplished lawyer, owned his own law firm. Almost every single year, he got the regional award as top pro bono lawyer uh, in the region because he was always giving his law advice away to people who couldn't afford it. Just always, always. Super generous guy. Also an elder in our church and an incredible Bible teacher and a wonderful friend. Kirk Bodie is everything that I want to be when I grow up. Do you know what I mean? And he gets up in front of the church and he's sharing his testimony one day. And as he shares his testimony, he includes this story that when his daughter, one of his two daughters, when his daughter got to be a teenager, she started to drift relationally away from him. And they got to be broken. And it wasn't coming back together. And he tried to reconcile with her and it wasn't happening. And finally she told him, she said, Dad, even though you're such this great guy, you've got a real anger problem. And none of those people saw it, but we all saw it inside the house. And your anger problem created a brokenness between the two of us. And I'm hurt. And at that point, he might have said, ah, it's just you. But wouldn't you know it, his wife Barb is standing there and she's like, she's right. Gosh, Barb. And what a courageous moment for mom to stand with her daughter and say, yeah, you big spiritual giant you, you've got an issue. So he had to face it and he had to work on it and he had to confess to his family And they rebuilt over time. And all of a sudden, he's up in front of his church and he's sharing this story. And why in the world, Kirk, would you share that story? That's hard. You share that story because the day his daughter confronted him on that was a good day for his soul. It's not because it was good for the outside. It was good for the inside. So how's your soul today? How's your soul? Like, I don't know. Here's a question. I'm going to have you raise your hands. How many of you are Judah and how many of you are Joseph? Actually, I'm not going to do that at all. (laughs) Of course not. But here's the real reason why. Because you're all Judah. Wait, that's not the way I've been listening to this message at all. I was Joseph. I was the rock star. Wait a second. That's what we do. We write ourselves in our imaginations as the hero in every story, don't we? Me too. I get it. But the reason the biblical author put Judah right next to him is because that's our chapter. We came from the mess. We make our own mess. Our kids deal with our mess. But here's the good news. You get straight A's. Come on, somebody. You get straight A's. Because Jesus died for that, right? You're like, wait a second, but if if I get straight A's, am I even going to try? Maybe not. But why should I try? Because if you bring peace and life and joy in the way of Jesus into your life and into your soul, who benefits? You do. You have a whole new life. You have a whole new marriage. And your kids get a whole new parent. And your community gets a whole new leader. Do you see what's at stake? Yeah, you got straight A's. Don't waste it. Jesus says this, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am gentle and humble at heart. And you'll find what? Rest, peace 
for your souls. <laughs> look, at what, look at what our gentle Savior is saying. And some of you Bible scholars in the room, he is the lion of the tribe of what? Judah. It's his title of that messed up guy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it says, and then Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Doesn't that make, mean something different to you now? He says, I came from a messed up family too. And I get it. And I'm the guy that scored you straight A's. And I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. Why don't you come here with your soul? Why don't you come here with it? I love it. He says, come to me and you'll find rest. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about a location. He said, why don't you bring your soul over here? Because this will be your soul's home. And this will be a restful place where you don't have to condemn yourself all the time for all the mess. Where you can actually try. And you can put one foot in front of the other and get your clean slate every single day from the cross of Jesus Christ. Isn't he good? He's so good. Just you guys stand? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Blows my mind. Let's pray. Lord, how's our soul today? Where are we at? Not on the outside where everybody can see. How are we doing on the inside? We want to thank you that we don't have to work harder at it. We don't have to fear. But God, you've got so much good for us. Help us to run to you, Jesus. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.